Okay, we got a, a great event planned for you tonight. Um, I'm sure everybody has kind of seen what it's about and everything. Before we get started, let me ask you all this. Okay. How many of you have heard about, have heard of Fifty Shades of Grey? Be honest. Okay. How many of you have actually read it or seen the movie? Be honest. Okay, well, keep your hands up. <laughs> Improv. Come on. <laughs> For everybody else, okay? These guys are the naughty ones. Remember that. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and get started right now. Um, let me introduce the speakers. Our first panelist is someone who's no stranger to cracking a whip or two. He is someone who has who was involved in building VA communities of practice at his former at his current organization. And he's currently the um, a program manager of innovation at SunTrust. You may also recognize him from his uh, recent appearance at VA World, where he gave a presentation on how the zombie apocalypse can save your IT project. Please give it up to our resident cartoon character, Mr. Hans Eckman. Our next panelist is someone who, you can say she's used to exerting her dominance. <laughs> By that, I mean someone who spent not only 10 years in becoming a VA and also doing PM work, but she's somebody who has developed a certain amount of expertise in her field. Uh, she is a, a published researcher in cancer prevention and also is working towards becoming a business architect, where she's combining her knowledge of VAs, business analysis, along with her domain knowledge to impact strategic business. I'd like to introduce Ms. Shaley Ann Matos Hyphen McClurin. Our third panelist for this evening is someone who's a master of role play. And by role play, I mean someone who has spent 15 years doing strategic consulting, developing business solutions, implementing process improvements, and currently he's a senior manager at JPN Consulting. And you can read his thoughts. Uh, he writes blogs about business analysis at practicalanalyst.com. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Jonathan Batkoff. We had a fourth panelist scheduled for this evening, Mr. Hans Eggman. Excuse me. Still here. We're brothers. Uh, Russ Pena recently took on a new role as an agile coach. He's been called out of the state. He apologizes for not being able to show up, but uh, he will be back in the near future to give a presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, this really is designed to be an interactive panel, so we're going to get things kicked off and kind of go where it's going. So one of the things, uh, as you saw from the description that we're focusing on tonight, is really the strategic leadership. Um, we've all seen, a lot of us have experienced what it's like to be a BA in the trenches, to do the tough analytical work, to create masterful thousand page documents that nobody approved, wants to read but everybody approves. Um, and what we want to talk about is how do you go beyond that? Um, and so we've got a great panel here. Um, definitely we need questions, we need discussion, so make the most of it. But to kind of start things off, I wanted to find out, Jaylan, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership means to me uh, having influence without a title. Okay. What is what is leadership not? Like, what would you say if, if people misdefine leadership or cons uh, something people consider leadership that you're like, no, that, that's the exact wrong thing? Well, leadership is not about truly having a lot of paperwork. So if you, if you consider yourself a leader because you have a lot of stuff documented, that's not the reality. It's more about the vision and the mission. And if you're, you're actually impacting the bottom line. Okay. Jonathan, what about you? What, what does leadership mean to you? Yeah, t to me, when I think about leadership, I think about somebody that has a vision, somebody that has an idea within their area of influence about how things could possibly potentially be, and, uh, and that leader acts in accordance with that vision. 
does the everyday little things, but everything that they do lines up with that vision in such a way that other people want to enroll, want to take part in that, and want to kind of follow along. So not, not coercive, but somebody with a vision, somebody's proceeding towards that vision and ends up being able to do some pretty, uh, pretty great things. Okay. What would you say leadership is? Leadership is not your whip being cracked over somebody's back, right? Don't we like that graphic? I think there's one flying all over LinkedIn right now that talks about the difference between a manager and the leader. The leader's out in front helping, you know, lead the charge, and the manager's sitting on the back of the, you know, the vehicle cracking the whip. Leadership is about setting that example, providing a vision, and then carrying the banner for where we want to go to establish that vision. And the manager, I won't even say manager. Managers should be leaders if they're doing things the right way. But it's, it's, it's not enforcing. It's not coercing. It's, it's enrolling and helping people come along. Yep. Excellent. Very good. For me, leadership has always been about taking a team, a group, a company where they need to be. Not where they may want to go, maybe not where they're told, maybe not where it's clear, but making the hard choices to take them where they need to be. And very similarly, you know, leadership isn't telling people how to do something. If you've told somebody how to do something, you're not leading uh, in my book. So kind of transitioning that into the BA role, Jonathan, why do we think BAs could be strategic leaders? I mean, all we do is take notes in the meetings for PMs, right? <laughs> <laughs> there may be a few people in this room that have to do that occasionally, but when I think of, of the BA skill set, I think of the ability to, to bring people together that are not necessarily in agreement in terms of what the problem is that we want to solve, in terms of how we should approach solving it, in terms of what the solution and success criteria should look like. And I think of the BA skill set and I think of, well often we're relegated to IT projects where we get an IT work request, we engineer our systems to provide a solution. But I can't help but think if we've got somebody who's good with people that is able to recognize those interpersonal and group dynamics to help shepherd shared understanding, why wouldn't you want that in the lines of business? Why wouldn't you want that, not necessarily at the board level, but at the strategic level, why wouldn't you want to help? Because helping senior executives get on the same page is the same as helping your developers and your QA analysts get on the same page. Different personalities, different levels of authority, but it's all the very same, and it's the same skill set. So to me, the business analysis skill set translates very well up or down the organization. Okay. Jay Leanne, you're kind of taking your career um, even further in that direction into business architecture, which is an emerging field. It's where BAs might have been 10, 20 years ago, where everyone's hearing it, nobody knows what it is, and nobody knows how to do it correctly yet. So how does, how does leadership uh, fit? Fall, figure into business architecture and enterprise architecture and, and more of those advanced roles? Thank you for the question. I actually see a trend locally that a lot of places are actually changing titles for like BA on steroids for like what might be in the future of business architect. But to answer your question, I don't want to derail, uh, pretty much uh, moving into like information maps, enterprise analysis. I remember when we had Barbara Cochranard uh, visit our chapter, she gave us good tips on that. And I could, certainly took it at heart and put it in practice. So I pretty much, when I go to meetings, I spend a lot of time uh, interviewing stakeholders. They don't know I'm interviewing them. I'm finding out their hidden desires and I kind of sift through desires versus needs. And moreover, just translate that in a page and not just a page, but something that's actual infrastructure and something of value. So I kind of try to sell the value proposition without just having the dollars attached. Okay, great. And I forgot at the beginning, because we didn't have a little whiteboard, so my memory isn't that good anymore. Uh, if anyone's tweeting, um, a couple things to help with that. Um, the hashtag BAOT is the universal hashtag for everything BA related. So by tagging that or searching for that, you can pull up all the tweets, all the conversations related to business analysis in the world. Um, also, uh, do you want to share your, either of you want to share your Twitter, hand, Twitter handles. Um, for the chapter, it's uh, at GAC underscore IIBA. Joanne? Create eight, Bitical, C-R-E, eight, Medical. Jonathan? Mine is J-O-N-B-A-B -B and the number one. The first three letters of my first and last name and the, and the number one. Excellent. Um, I had to fight for but managed to win and got Hans Ekman. 
So, first and last name, not case sensitive. So, what are some of the questions that you all have? You all came here looking for something, to get something out of this meeting in exchange for your valuable time, uh, other than the delightful food. Questions, areas, topics that you wanted to discuss. Yes? So, hot topic in, in the world we're seeing on LinkedIn and some of our groups is about the Center of Excellence, PA Center of Excellence. Yep. And I know, at least, Hans, you've got some experience in that area. So, is there some sort of framework that we should be thinking about, you know, infrastructure, that if we were trying to install a Center of Excellence, what would we organize that around? Absolutely. So, let me start off and then, you know, definitely chime in. So there's really, there's really three key groups, or three <coughs> key ways that you can organize, and you'll find that nobody's really centered in on which term means what, you'll see some variance. At the lowest level, if you have a group that is working together to make things, to make change, you have a process action team. So you can get a group of concerned BAs together and influence change, influence your methodology, improve templates, help get training, just by simply volunteering and pulling together work groups, study groups, things like that. If you pull together an entire community by a practice, by a business area, or by a domain, or a role like business analysis, that usually falls into a, a community of practice. The idea being it's a way of pulling people together, you share knowledge, you share best tips, you try and leverage each other's experience, and then try and foster the maturity of the group and its members through that. With a center of excellence, typically it is a group of thought leaders who are helping expand and improve the domain, working with and interacting with other groups, and often being the spokesperson for the BAs in this case. Um, how you start it is, you know, you could say it's the same way as with projects. You can start it from the top down if you have executive support and funding and sponsorship. Awesome. You know, or um, one of the presentations I give, and it's available right now, you can download, watch the video, is how to build a center of excellence in a hostile environment, which was how we did it at SunTrust. Uh, with Russ Pena, myself, and Kim McClandrick, we formed a grassroots effort, and over three years of influence and demonstrating value, finally got to the point where we were chartered and recognized. Um, and our whole goal there was, we needed somebody that was an advocate for the BAs because as how many people have experienced the BA is the dumping ground in the project world. Anything goes wrong, bring the BN, BA in, make them solve it. So that was the problem. Everybody just kept dumping all the problems on the BA. So we started running interference on a volunteer basis and were able to redirect that energy into the solutions that would actually work. Jaylian and Jonathan, you want to... Uh, thoughts on just, that? Just say that you know, in terms of the the center of excellence, which is more of a formal instrument, which does eventually influence process and how you how you go about your business. I would say that the community of practice is highly underrated yep. in terms of a, a mechanism that is not quite as formal. In fact, it can be grassroots and often is grassroots. If you've got a few, for example, in a former employer of mine, we had some BAs on my team. And then we learned that there were some BAs in another part of the organization that we didn't even know were there at one point. And we said, hey, well, let's start getting together over lunch once every couple months and have somebody present what you're doing in your area of business. <coughs> and really the only sponsorship we had at that time was I asked my director to get pizza one month and they'd ask their director to get pizza the following. And after a while, it really turned into something that people looked forward to, one, the opportunity to present, to hone their present, you know, presentation skills, two, to learn about what's going on in the world of business analysis. Three, the cross-pollination. Sometimes RPAs wanted to go do what they were doing over there. We had no clue that they were doing it right. until we started doing this. But uh, really useful tool, and it doesn't really take anything more than a couple BAs. It started out with me and one guy from the other team that said, hey, let's, let's take a shot at this and see if it'll work. Yep. And it really turned into something useful. So don't underrate, especially if you don't have a lot of training budget, which often we don't, right? right. That is a grassroots and very low-cost way of professional development. Oh. I'll throw it you know, at UPS, the the start of what is now, I think we would, in your terms, would label as the center of excellence. Mm -hmm. It happened because the CIO was a strong proponent of business analysis Excellent. and the, saw the need for it. But in order to sustain that, we, for example, up at the supply chain in Alpharetta, we have a, every other month, a BA forum. 
and in that we present um, anything from a BA skill, an underlying capability, or even just an introduction of one of the business areas or application areas so that there is awareness of what that group is doing or what another group is doing. So as simple as I want to make a change in my career, I, I'm tired of being in this group, now I know where to go. I, I, it's not just a, a dark hole. So there is, from both ends, it, it certainly helps to have the, the top-down support but it does take the bottom up uh, to sustain it as well as to, to follow. We can set all the guidelines and standards we want to, but unless you're a policeman going around and checking everybody's work, it, it takes that ground uh, grassroots support to really make it work. How many people have worked in an organization that has any of those? An action team, a center of excellence, a community of practice? Actually, a really good number. That's, that's excellent because in the past, that hasn't been the case. And also, they evolve with your group. So we started as a process action team because the word COE was massively shunned. Then we got sponsored as a COE. Then we did a reorg, so we didn't have a COE anymore and we didn't have sponsorship because our sponsors didn't exist anymore. So then we fell back and became a community of practice under Russ's direction where he tied together all the work stream BAs, again, that, that volunteer community as more of an information and sharing forum uh, because we lost the mechanism of change uh, that we had and the organization didn't need it at that point. We had solidified, we were stabilized. So you can also evolve and you can have both. Um, the team I just set up for as a security practice um, actually is operating both at the same time. The core group that owns the product is a center of excellence who's going to manage, own, and mature our use of the product base. But all of the users, all of the admins, all of the business sponsors are going to be joined in a community of practice so that they can coordinate changes, um, leverage each other's knowledge, uh, so forth. Woo! I'm at a company that has a very young community practice. By young, I mean just, you know, how long it's been around. Uh, what do you see as the various stages that a community practice could will move through to full maturation? Um, everything starts with a need, and you have to have thought leaders who are willing to spend their time on it. So the need is going to continue to change, and you're going to lose your thought leaders. So you've got to have a mechanism to replace it. So usually it is an uptake of great work and excitement, followed by a change in need, organization, or people that's going to cause it to crash, and that's going to go up and down and up and down. So the, it's kind of like a funding model. The more you can level out the waves and minimize that disruption, the better off. But there's always going to be threats. There's always going to be challenges, uh, and you've got to have a team that's ready to adapt. You guys? In terms of the maturity, I think that what we saw initially was it was more of a su support group, almost like your AA meetings or something like that, where we're commiserating <laughs> together and we're, we're sharing war stories and we're just kind of buoying each other up a little bit. But then when we got beyond that, it really became something that was recognized and they saw that, hey, these business analysts are, are serious about what they do. We were able to start having VPs come and present. And the last leg before I left the company was people who were interested in becoming BAs or people that were in other lines of business within the company that just wanted to know more about business analysis started to come. And we started to be able to make connections for job shadowing and some things that way to help prospective BAs to learn more about it. And so I would say it, it sort of moved from that support group to a true organizational asset. Jillian, where have you seen, um, kind of piggyback on that, where have you seen kind of that AA type group? where you are getting together to, to complain, <laughs> to share war stories, to talk about what worked, what didn't work. How, how have those groups been influential in the growth of your career and your leadership development? Thank you for the question. <laughs> I use Toastmasters, that's that kind of my AA support group, and pretty much I kind of feel comfortable about making mistakes in public. I don't have to make the mistake in front of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And also, like, from an organizational standpoint, I spend enough time, like, talking to people about the BA role. And a lot of times, because my strength is actually in the tools, I, I kind of uh, have a lot of passion for building tools. So I work a lot with gap analysis. And if you actually go and Google gap analysis, you'd be like, 
there's actually not a template for gap analysis. I actually did a, an experiment with our chapter, and I kind of talked to a couple of, of experimented BAs, and all of them gave me a different answer. And it's the BA Bach answer. It's depending on the format that your stakeholders want. Yep. So, Jonathan, um, a while back there was a, a Wall Street Journal study which looked at P the allocation of free time between very low income earners and very high income earners. And one of the things they found was the highest income earners spend a disproportionately high amount of their free time in extra career development, reading professional journals, staying up in industry information, whereas um, low income earners tended to spend actually a, now a record amount of time in recreational activities or more leisure activities. How have, you know, to get to where you are, as really an expert BA in the field, what are some of the ways that you've supplemented your career beyond the project world to help you get where you are, to help get you into that leadership position? I like the way you frame that, but I'll tell you what, my answer has nothing to do with how much money I make up. <laughs> What's well, achieve it all? No, I understand. High value no, people. <laughs> for me, you know, I, when I decided the business analysis was really what I wanted to do, and I wanted to get serious about being good about it, I went to Google. I started looking for the blogs. I started looking for books. I read Barb's, you know, Seven Steps to Mastering Business Analysis. And then one of the things that I did was I thought I've got some ideas. Why don't I just go ahead and write them, put them out there for public consumption because one, if I'm going to put something together and put it out there for the world to see, I'm going to think through it, right? I'm going to make sure that I've got things the way I want them and then put them out there for public consumption. And so I started blogging a little bit. and. Uh, what I found was some people really liked what I was putting out there. Some people thought it sucked. But either way, I got some good feedback and made some good connections and was able to learn. I think that by putting yourself out there, looking for stretch opportunities, for me blogging was one of those stretch opportunities. Another way was at the workplace. When I saw white space, I tried to fill it. Boss, hey, I see that there's, there's an opportunity here. It's not exactly what I'm doing and it's a little bit extra work, but can I go ahead and, and kind of fill that? And when they begin to see that you're looking for those stretch opportunities, you know, and again, to cite a statistic of, of our professional uh, learning and development, 70% of our learning and growth is by doing, by stretch opportunities and taking on challenges. And so for me, work was sort of a safe environment. I had a good relationship with my boss, and I never asked for anything that was going to put my career in jeopardy. But I just looked for opportunities to stretch my skills, to meet other people, and to try to do some new things. Awesome. So, Jaylian, you've participated in some of the conferences, um, been a longtime member of the IIBA and coming to sessions like this. How has that played into your career development and helped you get to where you are? Well, it has a lot of factor. And basically, I kind of see myself more like, okay, what should I tell the world about the business analysis? Because I feel like it's fairly much uh, an unknown, unrecognized profession. So, I have pleasure recently, I actually spoke about marrying data stewardship and business architecture because I saw the need that a lot of people are actually confusing business analysis with data analysis. So because I have a, a strong area in, in data, whenever they try to kind of pigeonhole me and say, oh, you're just a data diva, I'm not a data diva. And pretty much I can, I, I can speak the numbers game, but I can, I can definitely bring value, not just getting the numbers. More, I think it's more important than the structure. Because a lot of companies are actually failing in what I call process stability, and the process is always missing in action. And it all boils down to not having uh, a solid structure for, for what I call the delivery mechanism. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Um, in terms of the leadership styles, I know that you spoke about you don't want to whoop the crack the whip in the <laughs> back, and then again, you don't want to show them you know, how to do everything. So, how do you? Develop balance to leading other business analysts. Okay, so what, what are some of your best practices when you're working with a team of business a uh, analysts? Uh, having managed a team, I can speak to that a little bit. You know, for me, part of it was teaching good principles and, and frameworks, but not spelling out the nth degree what they had to do. You know, giving people liberty to innovate and kind of do what they thought was the right thing to do within their uh, area of opportunity. And, and another two, was to really help them understand that that you own your professional growth as an individual. You're 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 here today, but where would you like to go? And I think a lot of times we <coughs> tend to lean on our managers to give us some training. 
or sign us up for some training or give us a training opportunity when in reality it's up to us to come to management or leadership or whoever it is with a plan and say this is what I want and then that manager can really help facilitate. This is what I can do for you. Sometimes it'll be a formal training. Sometimes it'll be one of those stretch assignments that I referred to. It'll be, oftentimes it'll be good feedback. But, uh, you know, in terms of that leadership, it's really just empowering the individual to kind of take ownership of their development, kind of showing them the path, and then using his influence or his, her influence to help, help get you where you want to go. Julianne, what would you add to that? I actually walk the talk. So pretty much as a leader, I kind of uh, like to let my team members know, like, I don't know all the answers. So I sometimes show them half of the story, and I let them complete the story. And at times, I show them how vulnerable I am because I don't have all the information to make the decisions I have to make. Okay. Who, um, who here has seen a bad Pixar movie? <laughs> Anybody? One of the reasons Pixar has been so successful is their whole approach. From the very first day coming up with story ideas, anybody is invited into the auditorium to speak openly, candidly, and shoot down ideas and talk through. So what they're doing is they have pushed all their failure as far forward into the film as possible so that by the time they get into the animation and voiceover, they aren't having to do major revisions, which isn't, isn't that what happens in our projects? You get most of the way through your requirements, and then you find a constraint. The business need has changed. Something happens, and now you've got massive rework. Mentoring and leadership is the same way. It's creating an environment where your team can fail under a controlled circumstance. Try things out, innovate, but not so much that it turns them off or they feel that they've personally failed. So you've got to help them so that they can see it as a learning experience and then support them even you know you even though you know what they're doing is a horrible idea instead you can ask questions and, and and try and guide a little bit and and let them learn through the process and then that's where you really discover the people that will become the future leaders the ones that adapt the ones who overcome the ones who take that and then build upon it in the back yes so um how does that true or ideal IIBA business analyst come into picture or fit in a data environment? Is a BA even required in the data environment like the, like the BA that BA box suggests? So do we need a, so do we need, why is a BA needed in the data environment? Uh, yes, how do we fit in? And how do we fit in? Let's see, do we have anyone who's an expert in that? Jaylee <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, and the reason is this. Uh, there is a lot of conversations around information governance. I mean, think about it. There is part of it, it's just a business layer or understanding of the particular domain. So in, in that context, you need uh, a business analyst, not just with the domain knowledge, but with technical knowledge. Because you can actually uh, bring the product value, and you can actually, if you're working on an agile environment, you can impact the product. So if, if, you, if you get so creative, you come up to the point where you actually have a prototype. And a prototype is not a thing as a working product or a soon to be shipped to the market. So that's part of the reason why you need BA. And not just from the heavy documentation side, but to make an impact to the product long term. So, so Jonathan, uh, on that, what is the essence of a BA? Why does the BA exist in general? And then in the data realm, why is that just as important as a, a UX? Per, per, yeah, yeah. I, I would first say let's dispel the notion that there is an ideal BA Bach, you know, definition of a, of a business analyst. The way I like to think about it is very simple. Business analysts are communication experts. Our job is to create shared understanding. And whether it's data, whether it's a business, you know, problem we're trying to solve at the strategic level, whether it's trying to figure out what the next feature for this product will be, it's figuring out how we're going to address this competitive issue. Our job as business analysts is to bring people with different ideas together, get those ideas out, you know, get them into our heads with, you know, as, as little loss of fidelity as possible, and then model them in a way that other people that are going to do work with those ideas can understand. And so, yes, in a data environment, there are absolutely is need of a communication expert, somebody that can create shared understanding and somebody that can document and model requirements in a way that people that are going to build something can use. How many people here uh, as a BA work with or have worked extensively with data? At least more than half? 
I, I don't. I think it's inevitable. You can't do it. I just started working in a data environment, and I'm constantly struggling to understand where I fit in. So um, I was, I was and, and absolutely. And how many people would agree that that's true no matter which environment you go in? Yeah. One of the biggest challenges we have is people do not understand what BAs do. They do not understand where we fit in, the value we provide. Um, maybe we have the title, maybe we don't. Um, I was mentioning earlier that I, in my entire career, I've lived and breathed a BA life even before I knew what it was, but only for four years of my career have I ever had that title. Um, so it's part of it, and part of the leadership aspect is educating people, demonstrating the value, explaining the value, and working with them because it's, you know, it's tough. It's like, what's the difference between an ETL, a data modeler, and a DBA? Okay, within that space, they're vastly different. To us, they're just the data geeks. Uh, so that's hard. Rylan, you had something to add, then John, I'll come back. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, for those people who are concerned this in the merge space, <coughs> most of the senior VA positions that I've seen, one of the qualifications is structured query language experience or knowledge. So you've got to know how to do some queries to be in the same level. In most jobs, not every, but yep. John? Yeah, and I think the version, Babot version 3, is showing that evolution is yeah. talking now about design, which is, is a word that would normally put you know, the hairs on the back of your head, if right. you've got any, uh, would stand them up. <laughs> but there is, but the, re the realization that modeling, whether it's model a process, model data, model uh, interactions between people, all of those are aspects of what a business analyst should look at as far as a project and, and process improvement. Um, in, IIBA in has case. been very intentional about decoupling what a business analyst does from a particular role. I think we all recognize that we've kind of been pigeonholed. We, are, we, we work in technology, and so everything we get is a technology project. Forget whether the fact that this should have been solved by process or forget that this should have been solved by training of the people. We over-engineer our systems because everything becomes an IT issue because that's where the BAs are, that's where the project managers are. One of the big things that IIBA is trying to do and that we're trying to do and hopefully we'll accomplish it together is to really do exactly what we're talking about tonight. Show the value of what we've been doing for years in the IT space in the lines of business at the strategic director and VP level, helping them when they're coming up with the ideas for project, guys, wait a minute, does that align with our strategic you know, uh, direction? Oh, okay, didn't think so, let's, let's rethink that. Why wouldn't you want BAs there? So it's really, you're right, we're kind of coming out of obscurity as a practice, we're really trying to, to, to become recognized for the value that we bring outside of the IT space, and that's why you're seeing things like the, the language in the BA Bach version three, and we'll continue to beat that drum too. And I'll, you know, I think that different BAs have different strengths in their skill sets. So if you're working in an area where, you know, you need to become a beta, you know, you need to become a little bit better as a data analyst, then I'd say partner with somebody else at your company who is. Go ahead and identify that as a growth opportunity for you. But I know, I mean, I have very large teams of BAs often that work on my projects. And I assign tasks to different BAs according to where their strengths are. So where someone might be the best at eliciting requirements. Somebody else might be the best at diagrams. Somebody else might be the best at the you know, data analysis. So, but then when they all collaborate, you've got the whole perfect picture. So if it's an area where you need to grow, then just you know, find a mentor for yourself there. So let's flip this around. Let's assume that there's someone in the audience right now who doesn't want their career to progress. They don't want to be strategic. They don't want to provide value. They don't want to become a leader. What are the top mistakes, top career limiting moves that they can make to keep them exactly where they are today with no hope of progression and only increased frustration 10 years from now? <laughs> Chilean, go. How can I ruin my career as a BA? What are, what are the career limiting mistakes that, that you see and, and we have to all fight against? I think it's more about what what you don't say at the meetings, and a lot of times uh, we kind of act like a scribe perennially. But I think more than just executing a great job as a scribe, we, we need to actually let our voice be heard. And a lot of times 
it, it's speaking of those uncomfortable subjects, whether that is, are we actually compromising the positioning in the product in the market? Are we actually increasing uh, the waste cycle? Those kind of things. So if you don't speak up for that and continue to live as part of your reality, then that, that sets you for the wrong path. Top mistakes you see, Jonathan. Yeah, one of them that comes quickly to mind is, is stop asking why. And I don't mean that in the sense of I'm trying to identify the requirements. I mean in the sense of as we go about our daily jobs, not questioning why we're doing it exactly the way we do it today, why, stopping to question if there's a better way of doing what we're doing today. Always be looking for a different way, a better way. You know, the big functional spec is a relic from times back in the 70s. I think that you'll find there are probably several in this room that still do the big thick document in the same way with the same <laughs> system shell you know, syntax and all that. You know, there was a reason that things were done in a certain way at a certain time. But oftentimes, we just let that become the status quo and never question why we're doing it that way. Always be inquisitive and trying to look for a better way of doing things. Because if not, if you're just checking the box, I got my sign off, everything, everything says system shall, my quality matrix checks out, everything is good, I got sign off, I'm successful. Well, you might be successful in the sense that you keep your job, but you won't grow. You won't grow with that mindset and with that type of behavior. And looking at that also from a hiring standpoint, because I screen way too many resumes every year uh, when we're staffing, and it is very clear the people that understand why they exist in the role versus people who understand what you're supposed to do in the role. When you view yourself as just the skills that a BA does and market yourself and list out, I can elicit requirements. How many people here don't elicit requirements as a BA? How many people aren't team players? How many people aren't good communicators? <laughs> so we all have our weaknesses and our strengths, but seeing what's different, you know, assume that any BA can do any of the basic skills. What is it that makes you different? And for me, it's understanding the value and the diversity of your toolbox. The number of different ways you can approach a problem to solve it is what I look for when I'm gauging people on a BA scale from one to five, five being enterprise BA, because we're just now, we don't quite have the architect position that's, that's effective right now. Wu, you had a comment. For, I'm not in this position in my career yet, but for those of us in the room who may be in senior BA roles or might even be on a way to be a director or playing some sort of early executive role, what do you recommend that they do to, in terms of finding mentors or peers that they can connect with to have these types of bounce back discussions on? Because I think the further you move up in your career, it's harder to find peers. So what would you recommend for them? I find it actually easier to find peers the older I get. Everyone in here could be a peer, a coach, and a mentor to me. There is not a single person in this room I couldn't learn something very valuable from, very easily. What about you guys? How, how have you, what have been some of the inspirational mentors or peers you've had in your career, and how did that come to pass? Yeah, you know, I'll take the first cut, I guess. You know, one of the things I think, Wu, that is useful is not think of their not think of it as a single mentor. One of the things that, that, that we're encouraged to do uh, in, in my firm is to really, one, come up with that personal mission and vision and supporting values that you have for yourself, and then truly build up a personal board of directors, right? People that you go to in different aspects of your life, one might be professional, family, the things that interest you, and don't get so hung up on having a single mentor, but have go-to people in the aspects of your life that are most important, that are in a position to help you make make headway in those areas in your, in your mission. Jaylene, what about your key mentors? I won't listen my name, I'll keep them anonymous. However, uh, there is a book that comes to mind and, and it's a book um, that makes me think about it. It's, it's called uh, Life is a Series of Presentations. And, and the other book that I'm thinking is is a book that's uh, talked about, I can call now the, the title, I'll, I'll bring it back if it comes, but it speaks that you need different types of people in your life in order to be successful. So in that sense, I recognized early on that I needed different types of mentors for different purposes that I needed to seek. So if I was having trouble speaking at meetings, that meant I needed a mentor that acted as a sounding board. Or if I was having a particular problem in other area, then I need a mentor that's strong in that area. And that's the approach I took. 
Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's great. You heard from both of them, and I'm the same way. The diversity is key. Um, one of my key mentors, uh, Dusty Rhodes, I met over 20 years ago on a, through a client, and he meant, he's one of the top branding and marketing people, and he, and he has been a mentor to me on, on marketing, on advertising, on executive leadership, on business fu fundamentals that I just didn't have because I don't come from that background. And I'm teaching him how to be the smartest technical old guy because um, he's 72 and that's his goal right now in life. Um, another was a warehouse manager and a restaurant manager, John Whitman, who I'd exchange ideas with, completely different perspective. Another is my friend Redneck Russ. And you know, boy, he knows how to take something and then sell it, buy it and sell it back and forth for three, five times the value. Um, and then you take those patterns, you take those lessons, and find other ways to apply them, and apply other areas, and test them out and see. Because the lessons you can learn, the, there's, there's only so many root causes. So if you can identify what the patterns are, simplify something to its three critical elements, you'll then be able to apply it elsewhere in your life and, and come up with amazing solutions you didn't even know existed. Yes? I have a question about domain knowledge versus technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get to a point in your career where you're wondering if you should go deep technically yep. or, or deeper on the business side. And with a VA, it seems like you need to go deep on both sides all the time. <laughs> yes. But, so I want to say <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, and there's not enough hours in the day. So I'm just wondering, in your career, did you come to a point where you say, I'm going to go deep in this area of, 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 of my technical career, I'm going to go deep in this area of my business career, and, um, you know, we're, we're going to focus on, on just a couple of areas? Julianne, you, what about you? It's pretty hard, and that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of times VAs are pigeonholed as jack of all trades, so there will be probably some area that you will not be as great as you want to be. You just got to balance out each one of them. I have that conflict right now. I can write predictive models. I I can truly write it, but I'm trying to get better in data management. But can somebody else on my team do it better than I? Yes, they can. But I need to be knowledgeable on that. So you need to gauge what level of expertise you actually need to see in order in order to focus yourself because otherwise you will actually not be making any traction you just focus on too many things. Yeah, for me it's there are a couple questions. One, you don't have any choice but to become expert as quickly as you can in order to be successful in your current role. And so yes, it's good to have the technical understanding of technical understanding is what's required today, but in terms of at what point in your career do you decide whether you go deep? To me, that more speaks to what is your career path? What is your vision for where you want to go? I tend to do better at studying things in my free time or spending what time I have if it's something I'm passionate about and something I enjoy. For me, I'm not deep technical. I'm technical enough to be dangerous. But I want to know everything I can about the technical space because the more I know, the more credible I am with technical stakeholders, but I don't have dreams of, of being the BA that can do, develop it and architect it and do all, that's not where I want to go. And so one is we have to know enough to be able to be successful in our current job and we study enough and go as deep as we can in the area that's most interesting to us that makes us more appealing to the people that will be making the hiring decision and the jobs that we want to go into. Yeah, and piggyback on that, I'd say follow your passion. Mm -hmm. If you love it, if you want to be in that space for a while, Learn everything you can. The skills you learn to, that are a great BA, um, and I don't remember which study it is, and I need to write this down because I keep trying to quote it, found that of all the roles in an IT organization, the BA is best suited to become CIO or CEO. It's not the project managers, it's the BA. Because at the C level, you have to understand the business goals, and what it's going to take to get there. That's not a PM. A PM gets you from start to finish in a tactical project. A BA helps you get a project that meets certain goals and fills certain capabilities. So I'm a little different. I've gone shallow in so many different industries on a client-by-client -client, um, basis, 
but I've always felt I needed to know enough that I could help set the right long-term and intermediate goals for the team and know enough that I could remove the roadblocks and constraints before we hit them. And so to me, that was the level of mastery I needed because there's no way we can learn everything there is to learn about that space. And, and there are areas where you can do that, but eventually we've seen every major technology has disappeared. Every industry has been profoundly changed. I wouldn't want to tie myself to any of those long term. Hans, you know, you, you've just said you you had your career is taking you kind of shallow, but in a number of, of domains. Have you directed yourself to, I'll say, related domains? I just finished something, you know, in 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 billing. So now I'm, you know, or, yep. and that's rather. But now, so let me see something. I feel comfortable going to something like banking or credit that that is related to that and kind of moving yourself not big jumps but you know one square at a time i would say so but not that it was necessarily linear linear um because a lot of my career has been since the start of the web and <clears throat> netscape 2.0 um <laughs> and you know the, the birth of the internet the dot-com boom a lot of my experience turned out to be UI, UX, and web-based. Um, I've never been a mainframe guy, although I've worked on some mainframe type projects and areas, and I, again, know just enough to be really dangerous in meetings. Instead, when I found an opportunity that I liked, I picked through my past career to look for the things that would represent me well to that new one. So when I came to SunTrust, and, Normally I have jobs and companies every two years. I've been there over seven now. Um, and I came there and I leveraged my web experience to join online and online banking and help them revamp their online properties. And so for me, that was an introduction. I worked in enterprise architecture. Um, I uh, launched, helped manage a program for uh, removing all the paper-based products out of the bank. Uh, or, or making progress to removing them. You'll never get them all out. And then most recently, I built a team that does delivery for all of our technology risk and compliance teams. So it's basically in the security space, which, you know, I thought I knew security before I was in security and then realized I didn't even have a pamphlet on it. Um, but I've learned enough, and I, I've learned enough around the years that now I'm like, I want to give a presentation on this because the things I know and the terms I know, like identity access management, every BA should know that it's out there and least privileged access and all these things that you may bump into and not know. I'm like, no, I need to do a presentation on this. This is cool. <laughs> or as Jonathan said, this is so much fun. I just need to write it because it's forcing me to take those ideas and put them forward and, and open yourself up to that critique. So it's your career, your experience is up to you how to leverage it and take it forward. And it's not so much the, you know, we focus in on the, the BA skills, the domain skills, the domain knowledge. And in some areas, that's true. Medical, number one. Finance, number two. Niche applications like SAP, PeopleSoft, mm -hmm. some mainframe that they want certain experience. But that's not leadership. That's a commodity resource, uh, uh, commodity resources. To put yourself apart, can you lead a practice? Can you figure out how to solve complex problems? Can you assemble a team across many roles that can be successful? And Ryland has that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so to pose a question, I'd kind of like to elicit another question, a piece of information from the panel. Um, I'm thinking uh, that it may be very hard for people to look at the levels in which they're a leader without being titularly a leader. Yes. And I'm wondering, and I, a couple came to me as I was thinking about this, but I wasn't sure, if, I'm sure there must be others come to you. Like, if you've ever helped a technical, a, a group, a single or a group of technical professionals who are just locked up in the how of yep. something to understand, look, here's what the business is trying to accomplish, let's step back, and yeah, tell me that. Tell me how we get to there. But understand why we're asking for what we're asking for. That's a form of leadership yep. that you can explain and use on your resume or to move into a leadership position because that's a lot of influence without authority. But I had a hard time coming up with other, uh, other illustrative examples and yeah. I really thought I'd throw that back to y'all who I'm sure have a lot more. Great question. <laughs> now getting them off the how, one of the things I like to do is, well what other ways are there? I'm not saying let's not do it this way, but what other ways are there and why is this the best way? 
and just trying to get people to think more about the problem space and the options and trying to hone in on um, one particular how when we probably don't know it yet. Um, there are lots of, you know, Hans has referred to patterns, and I think that it really depends on the stakeholder and the group that you're working with, but it's that art of interpersonal, it's the soft skills that VAs bring to the table. It's figuring out with this dynamic, with this group, with this particular stakeholder, how can I walk them back to look at, okay, what we want right now is to focus on the problem and defining that problem before we get to that how. But, I mean, how, how do you, um, that, that's one example of what I'm talking about, but I'm kind of saying, how do you, um, how can any person in this room look at their experience and say, you know, that's a time I've done influence that authority or exercise leadership and help. And it might be that particular thing, but maybe it was moving a business stakeholder, or maybe it was getting a group, I don't know. What are other ways that they could say, yeah, I've done some leadership things without realizing, oh yeah, that's leadership. <laughs> Julian? Yeah. I have the perfect example for you, Ryan. <laughs> I've written many business cases. One is just complete and finished, not just from a conceptual standpoint, but from a realization standpoint. So I'll put it in an example. It's actually a data queue. It's a dashboard mechanism that is potentially powered by a visual dashboard in the front end product. I was behind that and not just design ways, uh, I was also behind the quality. So I had to persuade profusely a technical team around, look, this is not as quite as polished as you think it is from a technical standpoint and I challenged the design enough to make an influence. Yeah. So some, some examples that, that you all may have experienced um, if you've ever felt that you were a hostage negotiator in a meeting and the hostage didn't get killed, that was a leadership opportunity. Um, if you stopped the lemmings from jumping off the cliff because they were so excited and they knew exactly what something needed to be and you brought them back to the goal, the purpose, who the user was, that understanding, that's leadership. You found something before it got into production and you were able to fix it. Those are the leadership opportunities. So anytime you're not passive, but you're active, you're part of the discussion, you're part of the meeting, you're, you're not, uh, you're not, you know, if we're, uh, it's baseball, so this doesn't work as well, but we'll go to football. If you're up in the booth watching things, you're not on the ground and you're not in the game. To be a leader, you're on the field. You're there. You're not only doing your job, just carrying it out, but you're finding the way to do your job the best and to make everybody else on the field with you successful. That's leadership. So a lot of it is, you know, to Ryland's point, and thanks for bringing this out, it's not that, you, that everybody hasn't been a leader. It's that we tend to, especially as BAs, not think ourselves as leader. We aren't managers. We don't have HR responsibility. We don't own the project from a PM standpoint. You own the product, not the project. You own the success of the product. So the business, the entire business value is on your shoulders. Can't get much more leadership -y than that. <laughs> I think any time, you, you know, if, if you have, have shepherded a team through the process of deliberation, of duking out what is the problem, what are we going to solve, of, of figuring out what those properties and requirements are, and, and gotten them to that point, you've, you've exhibited leadership. But what I, the way I like to measure it even further than that is when I've gotten to that point and they've been able to use what I helped create to create a sex, successful solution, and when I get a thank you, I'm glad you were on this project. I really want to make sure that you're on my next project. I know that I've displayed leadership. Excellent. Got about 10 minutes. We've got time for some excellent more questions, more excellent questions, too. I've only been involved after the business need has been identified. Never once have I identified the business need myself. Welcome to the family! <laughs> <laughs> so I is it just me or does it come with seniority or what, what is that? No, never. <laughs> that is the immaturity of the universe <laughs> conspiring against us to prevent us from providing value. I would say there, there, you have an opportunity to be a leader. What I would say is do what you do, but to your line leader or whoever your stakeholder is, say, you know what, I think we could do a better job if we had a little bit more analysis done up front and identified what the problem is before it made it to us. 
this is great what you're giving us, but I think we might have an opportunity to do a little bit better job if we would, you know, let an analyst get involved a little bit further up the chain. Just, again, leadership, right, is having a vision. And it's about acting consistently with that vision. And if your vision is, I want to have more involvement in defining that problem before it makes it to me and it's already way off course, it's the small things. You know, and I presented this, I think, I don't know if it was to this group, but you know, you think of Gandhi, of, of you know, Martin Luther King Jr., it wasn't a single thing that they did that made them who they were. It was the little things that they did every day that were consistent with their vision of what the future could be that led to great things. And so, yes, we are all, many of us, suffering with the same problem that you're talking about, but by recognizing and articulating the problem to leadership, we get that started. Just a little bit of momentum. We could do a little bit better if we just, you know, could get involved with defining the problem instead of just dealing with whatever they hand us. Yep. Uh, one there, and then we'll come back to Wanda. Yes, Julie. In the beginning of your career, what were some of your obstacles, and how did you resolve them? Julie. See, I'll have some of those, but I'll give you a couple of tips. Uh, you know as a BA, the only way we can stand from the crowd is speaking up for what truly a BA is. And if, if you don't believe this, please take note. We are agents of change. And if you have read or have exposure to the business analysis body of knowledge, the change component is implicit. And I, I can tell you that if you see yourself as a change agent, you'll be able to stand out from the pack. What that means it is, I'm, I'm going to say this, please, what stays here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this will not be published on the web. You may, you We're may, not in Vegas. <laughs> you may have the luxury to choose the project that you're on, because let's say, let's be real, if you're always doing the similar functional requirements spec, and other people are as good as they can be, you're not standing up from the crowd. So you need to find ways to get the projects that you need to be on, and those that match your skill set or your strengths. Jonathan, early obstacles that you've overcome? Yeah, challenges for me, I, and this is something that I still struggle with, there is a certain personality profile that is successful in management and IT consulting, and I'm not that personality. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are familiar with the DISC assessment, I'm a strong S, very supportive, very, I'm not one that's out front and leading the charge. Often that's, I prefer to sit back and one of the things has been finding my peace, how my personality works best, because there are advantages as well to being the way I am. I'm a, more of a listener, more of a thoughtful, more of a consensus builder, but that's not necessarily what people are looking for in some cases. And so one of my weaknesses is just learning. And that's awesome. It's really finding what your strengths are and, and using them, finding a way to work it in. I know this will be a surprise to most people. I'm horribly introverted. I hate public speaking. I hate meeting new people. And boy, was that tough to get over. It, it's pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, uh, Wanda mentioned that, you know, a traditional way of management is to assign tasks to the people that have the skills to carry those out. When you're in a crunch, that's a really good way to do because you don't have the time to make mistakes normally. Um, I challenge you to go after the tasks and the activities that make you uncomfortable, that are new. And, and that's how you grow and, and giving opportunities to your team, helping people expand so that they don't get in that rut. They can see beyond theirs is, is extremely valuable as well. Wanda, you had to yeah. say. I'd like to hear each of you address this. You know, my experience has shown me to say anybody who wants to Learn to be a leader or recognize that they are a leader means you've got to be willing to take risk. You gotta, you know, put yourself out there. What do you for each of you, what do you think is the greatest risk that you have taken in your careers that demonstrated your leadership potential or your ability to drive your own career in the direction you wanted? All right, I'll give you guys time to think and throw myself in front of the <laughs> firing squad first. Um, I, there's been so many. And uh, as Bob the BA says, try and avoid the career limiting mistakes. Um, they're out there, I have made them, and it helped and hurt me in the same way. Um, so I'll, I'll use one anecdote that worked for well. Um, I made it to around 17 of layoffs um, with, a, with a telecom, um, which was great. I had a role, but it wasn't a role I was willing to go to, so I said, 
I'll help you until you force me into sales, and then just give me a package and I'm gone. And it was okay. Um, but finding a new job at that time, because it was a, a horrible time in the market, was really tough. And everybody loved what I could offer, but there just wasn't an opportunity. And in one of the companies, it was a consulting firm, um, the person said, basically, I'm tied down with this client. I'm too busy. I haven't had a chance to find new business, but as soon as I get that next account, I'll bring you on, and, and then you can work that account. And I was like, okay, I understand, thanks. A couple hours later, I was like, I don't like his answer. I'm going to reject my rejection. And so I called him back up, and I said, listen, if, if you're too busy to find new business, then you've got something that's limiting your business. This is critical. You can't do that. Can I t offload any of your work to free you up to do new work? Give me your grunt work. Give me anything you have, even part-time. I'm willing to do it. And if something opens up, great. If it doesn't, that's fine. And if I find something new in the meantime, that's okay, too. And it was like, okay, let me give it some thought. And then two days later, they hired me. They're like, if you can solve that problem for us that quickly, what are you going to do for our clients and what are you going to do for our business? And it was, it was kind of an accident. It was kind of like, well, I, I see a need and I, I think I can help. So by volunteering, that, that really set me apart and, and really caused the dominoes to fall into several great steps my career took after that. Jaylee you had one queued up. <laughs> Thank you. I, I most recently, I can't recall how many days ago, but it's as recent as probably two weeks ago. I, I kind of was asked, it's like, okay, tell me, Jillian, what is your deliverable? I was like, sure, uh, you know I'm a BA, so what exactly are you expecting? And, and they kind of have all these meetings going on, like business model canvas meeting. They ask me, what exactly you're going to deliver? And I say, look, I don't have much for you, but I really have one pager. Are you willing to take it to the meeting? I pretty much what that had, it's kind of a vision, vision document on how to build an interface inventory. And from a value standpoint, I did not attach dollars because that's not really where, what I had in mind. But I did code it with the standard color schemas and pretty much say, this is the direction we need to go. And, and whether they took it as reality or not, right now a lot of people are actually doing that work. There's like a village of people doing that. And, and that's just the foundation to get them started. Jonathan? I'm pretty risk averse in general, so this may seem pretty tame, but uh, I went into management and IT consulting out of college because I didn't know what I wanted to be with when I grew up. And uh, I'm back in it now because I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. But uh, when I started, uh, I had the opportunity to, to learn an Oracle CRM product, and I was a QA analyst. And I got pretty good at that. I got to where I knew pretty much everything that you could know about this product. And there was a nice little path for me within the QA space. I kind of thought it would be nice to have a little bit more client-facing opportunities, but, but I was safe where I was, and there was a nice path to promotion. And then I got the call and said, we need you to be an application architect. You're going to be doing requirements and, and designing a system and working a lot with the stakeholders. And I was mortified. Mm -hmm. I was scared to death because it's sort of the risk-reward. You're in front of the client all the time, and, and either you're going to do great or, or you might mess up. And I can mess up in QA, but I'm behind the scenes. and. You know, we, we fix that, we clean it up, and no one ever knows. Nobody sees the sausage making. But uh, it was actually accepting that first application architect role, which for me was, it seemed, okay, well, huge risk, right? But for me, that was taking a big job. It was something that I was not familiar with, something that I kind of wanted to do, but was not within my realm of, of comfort at the time. And so taking that first application architect role was probably, professionally, the biggest risk I've taken. And of course, you know, it, it turns out to be probably the best decision I've ever made professionally as well. Excellent. Before we close out here, because we're running out of time, um, I wanted everyone to give Wu uh, you know, a round of applause for coming up with tonight's topic, for pulling this together. Um, if, you, if you enjoyed this evening, if you took anything away, please give Wu a round of applause. For um, second, we're not. Okay, that's fine. You can. Okay. Um, uh, Jonathan and I, and, and Jaylee and you probably have, uh, we've got cards up front, so please connect, stay in touch. Uh, you can pick up Jonathan's uh, blog. Guys, where did all these quotes come from? Is there, are those online anywhere? That was the next thing I was going to say. So, as you're networking, as you have a chance, take a look at some of the quotes um, that are around. These are all quotes that I pulled up off of 
uh, only a couple of websites on um, uh, leadership quotes and a few funny leadership quotes. Uh, so take a look at those um, and, and see which ones resonate with you. It'll help you narrow in on your, um, what, your leadership and, and what's important to you. And in true Jerry Springer uh, fashion, um, we've learned a lot today. So final thoughts. Jaylianne. Final thoughts. Final thoughts on this evening and leadership. The, if, if anybody is going to take one thing away to remember, what are your last words of wisdom from this evening? I keep making promotion for be a bug. So right now, if you have not studied for be a bug, I would say uh, look, look for the, the business model canvas. I think that's one of the tools that's going to profoundly change the profession. Uh, I think there's other additions, but I'll encourage you to get a little more familiar with the business model canvas and how does uh, that apply to you as a BA so you can speak the language of business a little better. Jonathan, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Guys, you are in the right place in the right profession. You know, there is so much opportunity. We are just starting to be noticed for the value that business analysts can bring. And so being at the cusp and knowing that now and recognizing that we can all be leaders in small ways, you are all leaders. And so to quote the immortal Bill and Ted, be excellent to your stakeholders, be excellent to each other. Yep. And, and on leadership, I would say every superhero has a nemesis, has an arch rival. For your leadership, that is you. You are the superhero and you are your greatest nemesis. You are the only one in the entire universe stopping you from being a leader. And that's the hardest thing to get past and the hardest thing to admit. Uh, and the, o the only way you're going to get there is by taking risks, putting yourself out there, and failing with spectacular glory. And don't wear a cape. <laughs> Wanda, you had something with the slide you wanted to mention? Yeah. Thank you so much. And I want to... all of our panelists. We have such an incredible you know, resource here in Atlanta and here within IIBA to pull from. Always consider those people here at IBA your mentors also. And make sure that you carry your networking outside of these meetings. Literally, take the business cards, stay in touch. There's such a wealth of knowledge and networking opportunities. I do want to point out, I wanted to bring up this slide because I want to point out the statistics right now. Look at the numbers. American employers will need 876,000 business analyst related professions by 2020. You know, don't think that with, you know, with the advent of Agile coming, it means the BA role is going away. It's absolutely not going away. And something else I wanted to point out, and I hope you can see this, is the BA career roadmap. Okay? There are so many different directions that you can go. Be a leader for yourself. You know, you know, create a roadmap for yourself. Look at what the opportunities are. Identify where you are right now with your own employer. And then start identifying, research, what are the choices that you have to make? You know, where, your, where is your passion truly lie? And direct yourself. Be your own best advocate, but be your own first leader. And you can be that leader for your employer as well. I'm going to go down to the next slide. You know, because this, you know, this is for any junior BAs or senior BAs. And I'm going to go up, and this is going to be ad lib, okay? I'm going to let you look at the first slide and ask questions. And, I'll, and even though the panelists have gone back to their seats, you know, hopefully they can answer any questions you have. We've got five minutes that we can go ahead and touch on a couple of these. Does anybody have any questions about with the career roadmap right now that we're seeing for business analysts? Are there any questions you have based on what some of this is, comes off of the Ivy International website? So you can access it yourself anytime. With, yes. the, um, with the new Babbock version 3, how should, uh, how should BAs now try to pivot their career with what are some of the new things that we're seeing, like skill set wise, that you know, employers are looking for that we should try to you know, tailor ourselves to? Um, I don't know if anyone has any um, insight into, you know, really taking a deeper dive into the, the version, uh, uh, the, the Babbock version. I'll answer first, then I'm going to turn it over to Hans. One thing I'm hearing from the recruiters is agile, agile, agile. And another thing is um, client-facing. 
So that those two, right now, those two areas are critical and more in demand and are not necessarily the norm for every VA. So that's how you can you know, separate yourself. Hans? I would say it, it, it's exactly the reverse of that. The IIBA, other organizations, will spend the next 100 years trying to come up with a definition and guidebook and tips for what we do just to describe what we're doing today. So the skills, the need is always there. So you're going to see different iterations, different ways of describing it, different ways of modeling it, just like you do in projects. But what we do, the value, the need, isn't going to change. In Agile, there's no BA. Yes, there is. The role's there, the need's there, it's just spread across multiple people. So focusing in on that value, and, and there are, there's going to be hot things in the market. PeopleSoft, Oracle, um, SAP were the kings in the 90s and the early 2000s, not so much anymore. Um, Agile's really hot right now. Um, I'm going to come up with a new methodology to, to, to compete with Agile just for fun because it looks like a good money maker. Um, but there's going to be other things that are going to compete. Agile will taper off in 10 years and there will be something else with a bizarre name and lots of training courses to learn what it is. And Why is this any different than Rob? Does anybody else have any questions about a roadmap for yourself? Okay, before we wrap it up, I'm going to go back and do some recognition. Right now, the MPV program, as I mentioned, has, is just now wrapping up. Actually, on May 18th, we're having a celebration dinner. And I just want to offer some recognition. Anybody in the room who has worked on the MPVP program over the past year, would you please stand up? Okay, this project started last April. We ran the first half of the project via waterfall. Okay, we you know we studied diagramming, we studied requirements traceability, you know, you name it, and we covered it. Then we flipped the project to agile. We all show up. We also allowed BAs to you know to to fill different roles. So those who wanted to gain experience as a lead business analyst served as a lead business analyst. We structured the team with two project lead BAs and three team lead BAs, and then a team of four under each of those. Okay? We partnered with Georgia State University and had 13 developers that we worked with. Two of them worked in QA, so, you know, one worked as a tech lead. And so we, had, you know, we had Ivan, where's it, Ivan? We had Ivan serving as our scrum master. We had Rylan who came and was our agile coach. And we have worked now since January with the Georgia State University's capstone program. And we took 13 students who only one of them had ever written code before. And we're now delivering an incredible product for an orphanage in Mexico. You know, so it was an incredible journey. I encourage everybody who comes to IBA, don't just come to the meetings, but get involved. Whether it's BAMP, whether it's CPP, whether it's the workshops, whether it's the BA boot camp, whether it's the MPVP program. You'd accomplish so much more for your career if you get more involved. And I really, really encourage you to get involved. So feel free to speak to any of the VPs that are in here in the different areas. If you want to be involved in membership, if you want to be involved in professional development, please take a step up. I think everybody here deserves that. I have seen phenomenal growth with so many people in this room, and that's been the pleasure of working with IBA especially stepping up into a leadership role. And we've got so many who've stepped up now. I mean, you saw the list of how many new directors we have. You know, those are people that have identified, I want to you know, be a leader. You know, I want to serve the chapter in a different capacity. They gain a lot from it, but it's nice to see them giving back also. So doing it here, doing it at work, I just encourage you to do it for yourself. Okay? And with that, you know, also I wanted to mention that we do have a call for speakers. We're going to be sending out a survey. So for the next year, you know, Jonathan's team, the professional development team, will be identifying the workshops, the presentations, the type of events that we're going to be producing based on what you say you need. You know, what skills would you like to improve? What type of exposure do you need for your own career? We want to hear from you, and we'll know what to plan accordingly. Okay? Well, I'll say you don't have to wait for the survey. My card's up there with my email address, or just tell me now. If there's a presenter that you'd like to hear from, if there's a topic you particularly like to hear about, let's get it started. They're creating a demand list, so there'll be a whole list of items, and or if you know of any speakers that you would like to recommend, also let Jonathan know. Okay. And then lastly, I want to remind everybody that Tuesday, May the 26th, 
It will be the fourth Tuesday in May, so it's right after Labor Day weekend. We have an excellent program, and that's the role of the business analyst in an agile world. And our speaker will be Steve Krauss. So I hope all of you will join us. In the meantime, I also hope that everybody will go to our LinkedIn account, enter comments, and let's spread the word. Let's get me the word in Atlanta. You know, we have such a huge group to pull from here. And the better the networking, the better the relationships you form, is, the better the career opportunities that you'll have individually as well. So I want to thank everybody so much for coming tonight. You know, do feel free to, you know, we have five minutes before we got to exit the room, but we do need to exit on time tonight. <laughs> okay. um, again, I want to thank the MPV team, uh, MPVP team. They just completed the evaluations. Um, the students that participated, 40% of their final grade was dependent on their success of this project. You know, so I want to thank them for coming at 6 o'clock tonight to work on those evaluation forms that are going to end up resulting in those student grades. So, um, if anybody has any questions, I'll be hanging around outside for about the next 10 minutes also. But I thank you very much.